I've written so many female protagonists, and I'd like to know if there are differences in the way that female protagonists are received in the various media in which you work, um, not so much by fans as by the industry. Well, um, you know, uh, when Buffy had been on for about three years, we started pitching the uh, a Buffy animated series that never went and literally got, well, she's got to have a male counterpart who's just as cool as she is or no one will watch it. Um, and uh, you kind of go, really? And I, th I think we've moved past that. But you keep, you know, you're, you're always going to get this reaction against it until recently, um, you know, no female action-driven movie, you know, no female star in an action movie. It can't happen. They won't sell. There can certainly never be any Hunger Games. Oh, now it's different, you know, and that's great. Also because Jennifer Lawrence is awesome, see Winter's Bone. Um, but, um, uh, so, you know, the industry will change its mind uh, when, the, when the public, uh, you know, makes them. But, uh, um, in terms of comics, I would say, you know, that's a, that's a much, uh, you know, a much more fer fertile field. I will also say that I have been to Comic-Con for more than a decade, and every time I go to the floor, I go with the intention of buying a cool statue of a female, and I have yet to find one that doesn't look like a porn star. I was walking the floor yesterday and I was like, somebody needs to start a little like maquette business that has cool iconic poses from women um, that don't look like they're breaking their spines <laughs> and might be, dare I say, clad. Um, it's, uh, I mean, there's a male version of that, of being over muscular and, and striking weird poses and stuff. But honestly, um, it seems really late in the game for there to be nothing but cheesecake down there um, for the people to be buying and for the kids to be looking at. I think we can do it. I'm a big fan of both you and William Shakespeare, and I was wondering, what made you choose Much Ado About Nothing to do a short independent film on? Much Ado About Muffin, is it? <laughs> Much Ado About Muffin, is it? The lovely food. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, some practical reasons and some personal reasons. For a long time, I didn't want to do Much Ado About Nothing because it contained the words about nothing in the title, which for me is kind of a deal breaker. And uh, we had done uh, a bunch of readings at the house. Amy Acker and Alexis Denisoff had read Beatrice and Um Yeah, you guys are gonna freak out, sorry. Um, uh, and um, I always said, oh, I would love to film this with you guys, that would be fun. But I didn't have a take on it. Uh, if, I, if you put a gun to my head, it would have you know, anything you can edit, it would have been Hamlet which is my personal favorite. And um, then one day I did. One day I sort of looked at it. I don't, know, I don't really know exactly how it happened. It was at the end of the Avengers. And uh, um, I just, my wife said, you really want to do this? And I looked at it and I said, oh wait, I think I actually know what I think he's saying and how I would portray that. And, uh, and then it all fell into place rather suddenly. It's kind of a dark movie. That's why we have a certain noir kind of uh, crew shirts because, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of lying. And ultimately there's a real deconstruction of our notions of how love is supposed to operate and how courtship is supposed to operate. And, um, and he looks at it with a very cold eye and yet manages to find some redemptive romance in that anyway, and I find that uh, very compelling. So um, it seemed like, uh, who am I kidding? I just wanted to shoot Amy Acker again. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm sorry, I was just admiring your shirt. Yes, as I was admiring yours. <laughs> I should hope so. 
So I'd like to ask you, uh, at what point did you think that the Avengers would be something special? They would make all that money and be popular and so forth. Um, well, I hoped it would be popular the whole time. But um, I did not at any point think that what happened would happen. Um, I, it felt right. It was very difficult structurally uh, to put together as a story. Um, but at no point did I feel like we didn't understand what movie we were trying to get to. And um, it's one of the great things about Marvel is that, you know, it's run by Kevin Feige, who is a super nerd and really does get the idea of the story and the ethos of the comic that both he and I had grown up reading. Um, and, uh, but honestly, it wasn't until it happened, until, you know, people kept coming and coming back and coming back, that I understood that the thing that I was trying to do, which was to make the movie that I had grown up wanting to make because it was the movie I was seeing, the, you know, the summer movie that was still a movie, um, and not a ride, uh, not to sound like an old curmudgeon, which I also am. Um, uh, it felt like there was a need um, for that very, as he says, old-fashioned notion. Um, and uh, I had the need, and I was so busy getting the movie done that I didn't really know if I'd fulfilled it, but it seemed like not only had I done that, but that other people had that need as well, which is enormous vindication and, um, and a beautiful thing. So that success means a lot to me. Um, considering your recent success with the Avengers, and if you use the money that you did, sorry, it's weird in here. <laughs> I know, I know, it takes getting used to. But we're gonna get through this together. <laughs> but if you bought back Firefly and you did a second season, um, would you place it before Serenity so that Wash would be back? <laughs> No. <laughs> um, uh, because ultimately um, I wouldn't be able to move forward with the other characters at all. And, uh, um, you know, that there's sadness in that, obviously. I love Alan very dearly and inappropriately. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, you have to move forward. To keep him alive, I'd have to keep River crazy. And um, you know you, you you want to you know you want to be able to play all of the variations on your characters. So I couldn't just run in place. I'd have to go on to the next thing. I'm sorry. There'll be flashbacks. Okay. Uh, oh hi. Uh, first, I want to say quickly thank you on behalf of all the insomniacs last night for stopping by. I don't know if you've noticed, but you're very prolific. Like, you seem to write everything. Uh, and for most writers, when they do that, like if they have a TV show and it ends, it ends. But for you, you keep being involved with the sequel comics and the prequel comics and season eight. How do you avoid spreading yourself way too thin? I think we all know that I did not avoid spreading myself way too thin. <laughs> We all know there have been a few thin times in Joss's life. I'm honestly just a girl who can't say no. And, um, when I'm in love with a story and, and a universe, it's just, there's, it's, it's the most. Now, you, the, the other answer to that is, you know, what I call the Tim Minear factor. You find the people um, who can make it work when you turn your back to do the other thing. Um, it is hard to find those people. It takes years, and when you when you find them, you 
clutch them to your bosoms because uh, they are the people who can help you get through this because I need to keep telling the stories. But yeah, honestly, I had to hire a writer for this one, okay? A ghost writer. Um, and let me tell you something. I don't even think that guy is American because some of his words are really weird. Hi, Joss. Um, really quick, there are a couple of really cool Wonder Woman statues. They make you look okay. I'm glad to hear it. And you know, I did. They did. There was a Kitty Pride uh, that looked pretty good. I thought. Um, I'm not sure who did that. Um, my question for you is: uh, Do you have any plans to work on a stage musical? Here's the thing. Of course I do. <laughs> But I have too many plans, and see above re-spreading thin. So um, the question is, do I have the time to, you know, to commit to what would be one of the largest and most difficult ventures I ever could encounter? Um, I don't know what the answer is. I'm at that place right now where there are many different projects floating in front of me, and I'm trying to figure out which one is going to sort of descend and say, okay. I'm the next one. Uh, but yes, I'm dying to do a stage musical. Um, they are. They are the thing. And, um, and I can hear them saying to me, I'm not dead. I think I'll go for a walk. So there's still time before Eric Idol clubs them on the head. Hello, Joss. Uh, on my last deployment, I'm in the Navy, I watched all of Buffy, all the Navy, of uh, Angel straight through, and then rolled straight into season eight comics. Uh, I'm really digging the season nine comics right now. It's got the two sides with Buffy and then Angel and Faith. My question is right now, which one is your favorite between the two? Girls, girls, you're both pretty. <laughs> <clears throat> Honestly, I love them both for different reasons. And, um, uh, it's exciting for me, the Angel and Faith thing, because it's a little more new. Um, but uh, I love what we're doing with Buffy so much. Um, it's, uh, I, I cannot choose between them. You, you've given me a Sophie choice, and I, and I will not take it. I, I want them both in your face. <laughs> that guy's family better watch out. <laughs> Joss, a uh, huge fan of your work. I actually host an event called Weedenthon in New York City, four years running. My question for you is, will we get more fray? Um, okay. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, fray is, uh, you know, it's, she's a part of the verse now in a way that you can't really ignore. I adore her and all of her, her friends. Um, I'm particularly fond of Gunther. And, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, again, it's a question of when we have the right idea and the, and, and the time and the, and the talent. Um, she is, you know, very much in the mix. I want more fray. Um, I, want, I want, you know, more sugar shock. I want all of those things. But um, uh, we have to, it's gonna be a little bit. We got a bunch of stuff coming up and she's on the back burner, but she is burning. She is on fire. I set her on fire. Hi, Joss Whedon. Um, everybody loves what you did with the Avengers. The previous movies were good, but what you did with the Avengers was fantastic. So, would you be willing to work on any future Marvel movies, like an Avengers 2 or Ant-Man or something like that? Well, um, uh, you know, they got Edgar Wright in the house for Ant-Man, so I think... <laughs> status of that project, but if Edgar Wright makes something, then I go to see it. I want to go to there. Um, uh, yes, uh, you know, it's, I really care about those characters. They speak to me. Um, I do, you know, I did go straight from that to this, which means I did two things in a row that I didn't originate, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit rough for me. Um, but um, those characters 
um, you know, I grew up a, a Marvel boy, and so uh, I definitely, uh, I definitely have huge affection uh, for that whole world. So it's, um, you know, it could happen. I don't know, maybe, or Frey. We'll see. <laughs> I really enjoyed how you portrayed Natasha Romanoff in The Avengers. She was very strong, very feminine, and not the love interest, which was wonderful. Could you say a little bit more about uh, how you thought about the character when you went into direct Scarlet and looking at her in this group of men? Well, um, I love her character. Uh, in a way that I don't love any of the others, although I love them all, um, for different reasons. Um, she has the, the most darkness in her of any of them, and that's something that Scar Scarlett and I talked about uh, when we first met up, was that she has a really twisted past, and which meant that in the middle of my superhero movie, I got to make a little noir, and that was really fun. And just delving into that, and understanding her structure of how she deals with people, um, the idea of always appearing to be helpless and then using that to get people to reveal themselves to her. Um, it felt like the right character trait, it felt fun. When we shot the first scene with her, the first scene in the movie, um, where she's all tied up, um, the producer, Jeremy Latcham, said, you know, this is, uh, the only scene in the movie that is in it was in the first draft, word for word. And I'm like, that's actually enormously depressing. But, um, uh, but the reason it is was that everybody said, no, this just works. And uh, looking at it from that, I realized, oh, this works because it's my entire career in this scene. Look, she's helpless. No, she's kicking their asses. It's awesome. <laughs> everything you've done. My boyfriend is possibly your biggest fan. He's even got your logo tattooed on him. He wants you to sign it. Um, I want to know what it feels like to bring something like The Avengers, which is like this huge comic book that everyone knows from way when, and to bring it to a new generation in a way that like even my three-year-old loves it. You are warping your three-year-olds. <laughs> they, they shouldn't know that they're space portals. Okay, that's not something you should find out about till you're six. Um, you know, a, a lot of the work was done for me, obviously. Uh, I had an extraordinary cast. I had, you know, exceptional filmmakers who had come before. Um, I had a history of reading these characters myself. It, you, it really is just a question of loving and respecting these guys so much that um, when they speak, and when they move, when they do anything, it's the thing you always wished they'd done when you were reading the comic, or occasionally the thing they did do that you can steal, because it's awesome. And um, having that, that, that just complete focus on capturing the best moments of them, the best aspects of their characters, the best, the weaknesses, the, the, the page turners. It's always about, you know, the, the thing about comic books is, Every other page, you get a you get the chance to surprise somebody um, with a joke, with a reveal, with something horrible, something wonderful. You know, and, and there's act breaks. There's you know, every art form has those moments, but nobody has them as often as comic books do. Like you just can keep bringing that moment, so you're always looking for it. And if you put that in the movie, if it works and it's true to the characters, um, then everybody's happy. I think. That would be the most answer. Uh, just FYI, I think because you were right before Bones, they spent the whole time grilling David Boreanaz about Angel. <laughs> yeah. Well, then we should talk about Bones. Now, the baby. Why? Because... Uh, uh, Avengers, awesome, but let's talk Cabin in the Woods. What are the... What did the film strip bring? Which monster and what was Kevin? And if you don't have an answer, lie to me. Um, 
It's not a question of not having an answer. It's a question of whether or not Drew would want me to tell. Um, but I will tell about Kevin. This was a very painful thing for Drew because I was the one who insisted we had to cut Kevin. Kevin was just a guy in a shirt that said, with a name of the thing that said Kevin, who would just horribly murder people. Um, but um, we had so many monsters going on and so many people running from them. I was like, I don't think visually anybody's gonna get how awesome Kevin is. So we didn't get to show Kevin. And I, Drew hasn't spoken to me since. <laughs> No, that part's not true. Now, you also have a good shirt on. It's a very good shirt. Um, I was just wondering what constraints you found uh, making Much Ado About Nothing, because it was a much smaller budget than The Avengers. Um, which, by the way, uh, when I said, my answer to the question of why I made it, um, uh, I forgot to include the fact that it all takes place in one location. Um, which meant that uh, I didn't have to buy a location. So that was also a big consideration. Um, ultimately, you are going to have the exact same set of problems um, in any situation. Uh, if, if it's Avengers or Much Ado, your actors are doing other projects. You scheduling them is a nightmare. Um, you know, locations are a problem. There's always going to be the same sort of thing. They work on a different level, but it really is. I mean, I spent the first three weeks of Avengers going, this is more like making an internet musical than anything I have ever done. <laughs> um, we were always one step ahead of the Reaper. The one thing I will say, um, filming at your house seems like a really great idea. Ah, yes, yes, thank you. Um, it's the address of that guy's family. Um, <laughs> But here's the thing about filming at your house. Uh, all people ever do is mow their lawn and make their dogs bark and there are airplanes and uh, sound, uh, it was like a nightmare. Um, apart from that, uh, you know, it really is, you know, you, I've always, you know, I work with what I've got. When the WB, we didn't have much money. We figured it out. Um, and that was the same uh, with, honestly, with Avengers. I know that sounds crazy. We had plenty of money, but we knew where it was going. And they were like, you have this much time to shoot this really important dialogue scene and no more. Um, you know, we can't find this location. We have to use, I mean, you know, all of the problems, they're all gonna happen all the time. And, and you know, you have to learn to bend your, your way around them. One of the reasons um, we shot Much Ado in black and white was that it is a noir, and one of the reasons was that it looks very elegant. And one of the other reasons is we just couldn't, we didn't have time to really create a, a comprehensive lighting package. We used a lot of sunlight, but then we had to sort of use a lot of um, fake sunlight, and just mixing the color temperatures would have taken so much time um, that we just said, if it's black and white, no one will ever know. There's one scene we shot one side of at night and another side of uh, at noon, and you categorically can't tell. Um, and so you have to, you know, you take that into consideration too, and you build with the tools they give you. But it is never, I was never like, boy, I wish this was Avengers where I could digitally replace blah, 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 blah. No, it's, it's, am I having incredible fun? Do I care about what these people are doing? And is the craft service good? <laughs> Um, I'm obviously not alone in being deeply impacted by your portrayal of women in the media, which is, you know, very zeitgeist changey, and um, you rock for that. Uh, but there's another strand in your writing that I haven't heard you talk about as much that I'm interested in. I really enjoyed reading some of what you wrote during the writer's strike a few years ago. I'm actually a union organizer by trade, and in a lot of your work, you've portrayed sort of a corporate big bad that's appeared in Angel, in Dollhouse. So in 30 seconds or less, can you tell us what is your economic philosophy? 